This is a cautionary tale for every country and every generation. The story of what happened when a civilized and cultured people surrendered its will to a charismatic political leader. The story began a hundred years ago, here in the Austrian town of Braunau, with a child born in this house, Adolf Hitler. For when I came face to face with Hitler, I felt I had come face to face with God. He wanted to create a better world, and when he died, I had the feeling I had lost my father. In the death camps of the Second World War, Hitler's Germany came closer than human beings have ever come to creating hell on earth. The terrible truth, which most people still find too terrible to accept, is that despite his crimes against humanity, Hitler was a political genius, a man with a fatal attraction for the German people. At his peak, the most popular ruler in Europe, the child born here in Braunau, belong to that handful of human beings who have clearly and decisively changed the history of the 20th century. Linz, Austria, the site of the only memorial to the Hitler family, the grave of Hitler's parents. Nothing about his parents or Adolf's early life gave any hint of the extraordinary career that was to come. His father, Alois, was a stern, short-tempered customs official who beat his son. His mother, Clara, tried to protect him. When she died, young Adolf was broken by grief. He kept her portrait with him for the rest of his life. The infant Adolf was baptized and brought up as a Catholic. At the age of six, he entered the monastery school at Lambach. Soon, he was top of his class. Hitler was a chorister at the great Abbey Church of Lambach. I used, he said, to intoxicate myself with the solemn splendor of the services. Every day when he sang in the choir, he saw the memorial to an earlier abbot. Above it was an emblem which a quarter of a century later, Hitler was to adopt for the Nazi party, the swastika. In his teens, Hitler became a moody adolescent. At secondary school in Linz, he lost interest in most of his work. His ambition was to go to Vienna and become an artist or architect. Once there, he produced architectural drawings and watercolors like these, competent, but not good enough to win the place he longed for at the Viennese Academy of Fine Arts. Little by little, all Hitler's early ambitions in Vienna turned sour. After the shock of being turned down twice by the Academy of Fine Arts, he became a drifter. Hitler later called his period in Vienna the most miserable time of my life. Three of those miserable years were spent here in a Viennese back street at this hostel for homeless men. In this depressing hostel, the future Führer passed much of the day sitting with other inmates churning out drawings and watercolors which earned him a modest income. When he drifted from Vienna to Germany in 1913, he was still dreaming of becoming a great artist or famous architect. Munich, the 1st of August, 1914. A cheering crowd welcomes the outbreak of the First World War. On the right is a photographer, and among the crowd he's photographing is the 25-year-old Adolf Hitler. 
Now, for the first time, film has been discovered of Hitler at this turning point in his life, as he waits to enlist as a soldier. For me, as for every German, said Hitler, there now began the greatest, most unforgettable time in my earthly existence. He discovered in war a sense of purpose he had failed to find in peace. The years of drifting were at an end. When his unit arrived here in the fields of Flanders, he had no doubt that Germany would win a great victory and that his destiny was to take part in it. Then came the misery of trench warfare. Here in this group of dugouts and trenches near the town of Ypres, Hitler spent days on end, knee-deep in the mud, while enemy artillery pounded the German line. Hitler served as battalion messenger, which was anything but a soft option. Part of the two-mile run to battalion HQ ran the gauntlet of enemy machine guns. From one of these covered trenches, Hitler wrote to a friend, I've been risking my life every day, looking death straight in the eye. His commanders tended to agree. Hitler's bravery won him the Iron Cross twice. On one occasion, he captured four French soldiers single-handed. The day he received his first Iron Cross was, he said, the happiest day of my life. Fighting opposite Hitler during the last German offensive in 1918, was the future British Prime Minister Anthony Eden. Later, in the 1930s, the two men reminisced together. I had marked Hitler that this was the, nearly the anniversary of the 21st of March, 1918, when the Germans broke short of his army and very nearly got to the Channel ports. And he said, were you in that battle? So I said, yes. And he said, so was I. I became very eager and talked all about it. And we discovered that we were virtually opposite each other. And on the back of the menu card, we drew the, our lines. He drew his side of the line, I drew mine. With his signature at the bottom, on the other side. And let me tell you, the corporal knew a great deal about that line uh, and, and, and where everybody was, much more than I think an average corporal would be expected to know. Until almost the last moment of the war, Hitler kept his faith in a glorious German victory. But in the autumn of 1918, his world collapsed around him. A gas attack left him blind for several weeks. Then came the even greater shock of the German surrender. Defeat was followed by a humiliating peace at Versailles. The injustice of Versailles rankled with most Germans for the next 20 years. Unable to accept that the German army had lost the war, Hitler convinced himself that the soldiers had been stabbed in the back by communist revolutionaries and parliamentary politicians. This is a contemporary poster. The stab in the back, he believed, was part of a great Jewish conspiracy. The Jews, the oldest scapegoats in European history, became in Hitler's embittered imagination the scapegoats for Germany's humiliation. The filthy Jewish rabble, he declared, drove our people into the dreadful calamity of 1918. Hitler's obsession with that calamity propelled him into politics.